Thank you, Chairman Schweikert, uh, for holding the hearing. Uh, my first question is for Ms. Miller. Um, in December of 20, uh, 2022, the Secret Service announced that hackers linked to the Chinese government stole at least 20 million uh, in U.S. COVID relief benefits, including uh, UI funds uh, in over a dozen states. Um, a former assistant U.S. attorney who indicted these hackers uh, from this Chinese criminal group in both 2019 and 2020 said that the hackers have, quote, tens of thousands of machines, quote, end quote, going at one time to obtain personally identifiable information uh, and generate criminal profits. Even more concerning, officials and experts told one media outlet that other federal investigations of pandemic fraud seem to point back to foreign state-affiliated hackers. Uh, so my question, uh, Ms. Miller, uh, American officials have blamed Chinese hackers for the breaches of OPM, uh, of Anthem Health, and Equifax. And it's clear that um, COVID fraud is not just a domestic issue, this is a matter of national security. So based on uh, your experience working with the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee, uh, which is a member of, uh, of course, of DOJ's inter uh, International uh, Organized Crime Intelligence and Operations Center, um, what are the national security implications, in your view, uh, of foreign state-affiliated hackers stealing taxpayer funds that were intended to be uh, for COVID relief uh, benefit programs. Yeah, we we data on this is uh, is still is still being evaluated, but there's some estimates that half of the pandemic unemployment assistance fraud went to adversarial nations, um, and that's that's pretty pretty problematic when you consider that people when they think about fraud they think oh it's just a little rounding error it's a problem these are this was fraud that's funding our adversaries. That's what happened during the pandemic. And that's why there's so much attention on it, which is, which is valid. These hackers, and they, there, is, there is a full underground market of fraud actors today. We call it fraud as a service. And it is a full, those fraud actors, they have at their disposal really sophisticated artificial intelligence tools. They have the f flexibility and agility to be able to, to, to move. If something's not working, they can just take something down and put it back up. We've seen where the DOJ has taken down a, a malware site and it's been back up two months later and it's even more effective. So we cannot so we cannot fight this adversary the way that we are currently fighting this adversary because this adversary is serious and they're looking to steal money to, to, to create not just a financial problem but a national security problem. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Uh, Ms. Shea, um, what are the existing tools that agencies can be using to prevent uh, money that is fraudulently claimed uh, from going out the door? So um, GAO is dedicated to helping agencies enhance their strategic approach to fraud risk. You know, we're always going to come back to what it is that the program managers can do. And, you know, you're hearing a lot about um, the risk involved. And so trying to encourage them to better understand that risk so that they can strategically plan for it, identify what the best solutions are. And we do that through things like our fraud risk framework, which lays out 38 leading practices, a roadmap for agencies to understand how best to strategically manage risk. We've developed an anti-fraud resource, which is a web-based, interactive, user-friendly guide that lays out the who, what, when, why, why and how of you know, how fraud happens so that they can understand and take action. Um, there are other tools and resources like Treasury's anti-fraud playbook, which helps agencies figure out how to best manage their risk and understand them. So um, in addition to a couple of um, uh, matters that we have recommended to Congress to take to help address these issues. And um, in your position of uh, Director of Forensic Audits, you made recommendations to federal agencies on how to improve their fraud prevention. So number one, have the agencies agreed with those recommendations? And number two, uh, have they implemented those recommendations? So we have made a number of recommendations in you know, normal operations and, of course, in the COVID programs. And uh, I'd say about 27 overall, 28 overall related to COVID-specific fraud risk management. And there are still, I think, about 18 of those left open. So agencies do not always agree, and that's true in normal operations. We don't always get agreement, and that relates back to the mindset issue. They, aren't always um, appreciating the, the risk that exists. Thank you. Uh, thanks to the panel for being here. I yield back. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Fitzgerald.